1880, five brothers took a $200 loan from their uncle George to found a company that would turn into one of the largest producers of aluminum cans in the world. And let's just say you can see aluminum cans in the hands of many NFL fans each and every game. See, the funny thing is, this company I'm referring to was responsible for founding one of the original 14 teams of the NFL, and it all started in a little nobody town called Congerville. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is October 3rd, 1920, the day we keep coming back to. But this time, we are in Rock Island, Illinois to face against the Rock Island Independents. This also happens to be on the first regular season day in NFL history. But to some, this could arguably have been the first NFL game between the APFA teams. Well, however, we leave that to much of the imagination because we believe this was actually the second game that was played on that day. Rock Island lit the firecracker on the Muncie Flyers, and they were shot through the stratosphere because they would defeat the Muncie Flyers 45 to nothing. It's a valiant effort, I guess, because they at least showed up to the stadium coming from a smaller town. I mean, Muncie wasn't super small, but they came from a smaller town within Muncie. However, they got slaughtered. It was reminiscent of the Punic Wars. This comes from History.com, mind you. In the First Punic War, Rome was victorious, and in this scenario, that would be Muncie Flyers being invited to the September 17th, 1920 meeting with Ralph Hay and the gang. Then, the Second Punic War comes. This would be the game on October 3rd, 1920. And here's a quote from Evan Andrews via History.com. Remember this. In this story, Rome is Muncie, and Hannibal would be the Rock Island Independence. And it goes as such. Rome had emerged the victors in the First Punic War, but at the start of the Second Conflict in 2018 BC, the Carthaginian general Hannibal staged an audacious invasion of Italy via the Alps. Since then, his mercenary army of Libyans, Numidians, Spaniards, and the Celts had rampaged across the countryside, laying waste to farmland and trouncing Roman legions. In just two major battles at the River Trebia and Lake Tresemene, Hannibal had used his military genius to inflict as many as 50,000 casualties on the Romans. Again, it was awesome to get in the meeting, but just like Hannibal's to those Romans be like, welcome to the APFA, rookie. But why do I say rookie? Because everybody was a rookie in the 1920 season, right? I mean, all teams, that was the first time the NFL had ever played any games, well, APFA, but they were not necessarily on the same level as some of the other teams. They were just happy to come to the party. I mean, they came from Muncie, but the team originated from Congerville. Really, it's like a little suburb of Muncie, and they were called the Congerville Flyers. And in an interview with the Delaware County Historical Society president, Chris Fluck, came on the Indiana Public Radio. And it kind of gives you an idea of what football was like back in that day. And here it goes. Congerville was at one point a neighborhood in the south side of Muncie that was a working class, industrial neighborhood. In the first two decades of the 20th century, there was just this Bush League football that existed all over Muncie. Churches and neighborhoods had their own teams. Congerville had two main teams, the Giants, who became the Flyers, and the Congerville Athletic Club. So there you go. I mean, you're talking about churches randomly having their own neighborhoods, teams, two even in Congreville, this tiny little area. So they are not on the level of some of the other teams that we talk about, the Decatur Staley's, the Chicago Cardinals, just all these other kinds of teams that would be a little bit bigger. But he would also go on to explain how reading through the different newspapers and such, that football was still a very popular sport in this area. 
and it wasn't like they were going to sit back when there was a possibility of a chance to be in this new formed league with these bigger teams. I mean, Kent and Bulldogs and the Columbus Panhandles and the other famous teams. So when the time came, they would decide that it, they'd be better off becoming the Muncie Flyers. So they'd be the Muncie Flyers. And this team, the Congerville Flyers from the south side of Muncie, well, let's call them the Muncie Flyers. This area was filled with employees from the ball company. This is the one that we talked about at the beginning of the episode. Now the ball company is one of the largest producers of aluminum cans in the world. But it wasn't always that way. This information comes from Ball Company's history and timeline on the website. And back then, the company started out by making wood jacketed tin cans for products like kerosene and paint. Then in 1884, they started a manufacturing of glass home canning jars. Yes, ball canning jars. You've probably seen these all throughout your grandma's kitchen and down in the cellar where they keep all the canned pickles and stuff. And I don't know what else, but I like me some pickles. If I have to go with the perfect, I'd say zesty dills are my jam. But 1887 was also an important year because this is when the brothers would move the shop from Buffalo, New York to Muncie, Indiana to take advantage of the natural abundant gas reserves and all that kind of thing because they wanted to grow the company. Hey, you got to have some natural gas reserves to make all these glass bottles. And even though 1887 wasn't quite the year that the football team would be born, this is the year why it's important because they would move from Buffalo, New York to Muncie, Indiana. And if you want to learn more about the company, Ball's history, I'll leave a link in the show notes to you for Ball's website and other links too that I use for research in this episode. Which, by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player of choice or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest out the press episodes each and every week. But let's flash forward a little bit. 1887, they moved to Muncie. 1905 would be the year that the Congerville Flyers would come into existence. They were known as the Congerville Athletic Club, and Earl Ball was the manager. Well, he was the manager later. I'm not quite sure when that happened, but it looked kind of like he took over operations for the team somewhere about 1917. But according to Roy Sy via Pro Football Researchers Association, around about 1918, 19, 19 or so, that's when they decided to start upgrading the schedule. Mind you not, this is all wrapping around World War I area, so you got a lot of different scenarios going on. But they would play mostly neighborhood teams prior to this. Then he decided, let's venture into places like Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and other bigger cities and the likes. Also hosting a team called the Cincinnati Celts and the Dayton Oakwoods. And in that same interview with Chris Fluck, he mentioned how scheduling was just different. Different than it is nowadays. I mean, they didn't even have any kind of uh, special leagues all the time. It was just randomly, let's challenge these guys. It was divided by weight. As in, you take the average of your player's weight, and whatever that average is, well, you're going to go find another team, and you're going to play them with the same weighted average. I guess it's kind of like boxing, where you have having weight classes. I don't know. And you also didn't necessarily have this schedule that was put together by an administrator or something. You just might have to call somebody out and maybe call their bluff. So, like, you know, you call them chicken. They're like, what's that? You, you, you yeller, you know, back in Back to the Future and that kind of thing. But, well, this comes from the interview with Chris Fluck, and it was uh, kind of a way to call out a team. And he said that you would call out a rival team in the newspaper. You'd say, we're calling out the Congerville Flyers to play the industry linebusters on such and such a time and day. And they'd either show up or they'd respond in the newspaper. I mean, how weird is that? You know, I, I guess it's no different than today, maybe social media or even playing it on the news or the radio or whatever, just calling people out in different, I don't know, fantasy football teams talking smack to each other in software nowadays and that kind of thing. And back then, that's what you had. You had the written form, the typed form of communication if you wanted to get to the masses. So that's what they did. They tossed it in the newspaper. But no matter the situation, Earl Ball 
would end up joining the meeting on September 17th, 1920 in Ralph Hayes Auto Showroom. Again, the big meeting, the founding of the NFL. Little tiny Congerville Flyers, really were represented as the Muncie Flyers, would be present for the foundation of the NFL. The one that I keep talking about. This tiny little town from nowhere, Indiana. Congerville. Well, we'll call it Muncie, though. It's a little bit bigger. It's almost like they were saying, hey, come to this meeting. We'll let you eat at the parents' table. But didn't turn out too well. That first game, 45 nothing. And a pro football researcher's article from Roy Stye stated that Ball came away from that meeting with confirmation they would play those Rock Island Independents. But for some reason, it stated that they would play him on October 10th. I'm not sure what happened. And it also said that he wanted to schedule a practice game on October 3rd against Fort Wayne Friars or the Decatur Staley's. For some reason, though, they ended up changing things up. The practice game would be changed to September 26th against the local Muncie Tigers, and then the Hannibal game would be on October 3rd, 1920. Again, I'm not sure why it changed, but it did. And then some reported that the Flyers did have a game scheduled against the Decatur Staley's the following week. But after this Rock Island, Hannibal, just slaughter kind of game, sounded like the Staley's canceled because they did not want to deal with possibly not having any fans in the seats. This terrible defeat would cause more than just an L in the standings for the Muncie Flyers. And sadly, the Muncie Flyers would fade away that first season. Only, at least according to the official records, they only played one game with an official zero wins and one loss record in the 1920 season if you look at NFL.com standings. But just as the Phoenix rose from the ashes, so did the Muncie Flyers. Because in the 1921 season, they were back, baby. Back for a reunion tour. But someone forgot to fuel up their tanks because they came crashing back down to earth. They would end that season with only two games. They would go 0-2. and two. So they didn't really have that much better of a season for an ultimate finish. Because they would end up just calling it quits after the 1921 season. They'd finish with 0-3 and three record in the entire tenure within the NFL. So that's not really something to brag about. What is to brag about would be showing up September 17th, 1920, being a part of the founding of the NFL and being able to say that they're one of the original 14 teams ever. They can't take that away from them. Sure, they can take away their glory because they would lose 45 to nothing in their first game and they will go 0-3 in their entire career in the NFL, well, APFA. They would even make it to the NFL. The NFL wasn't even coming around until like 1922. However, they were still there at the beginning. But I want to go back to that 1920 season. Because Roy Sy's article described a little bit different. He said how they were more games that they played. And even though the NFL gave them a record in the NFL.com standings, officially of 0 and 1, there were more games that were whether they were scheduled to play and didn't play, or then there were also some games that they did play. So let's kind of go over that season. After that Staley's game, the Decatur Staley's game was canceled on October 10th, they couldn't find another opponent for the 17th or 24th. But then the article stated that they had the Cleveland Tigers on tap for Halloween and then the Dayton Triangles the following week. Now we know that Halloween is like a spooky time and it was spooky for them too. In fact, Halloween, I guess, dates around 2,000 years ago. It was something called the Ancient Celtic Festival Samhain. To the Celts, it was November 1st as the New Year, and they believed that the night before the New Year, the worlds would just basically merge between the living and the dead. They were blurred, and ghosts of the dead would return to Earth. So October 31st would be Halloween, a long-time tradition, all sorts of changes and such, but the scary thing would happen. Yet it was also exciting because the new year was coming. It was coming for the Celts. And back then, it went the same for the Muncie Flyers because finally this game on October 31st against the Cleveland Tigers. I mean, this is a bigger city, man. We're talking about Cleveland. But then, just like the ghouls and ghosts would come pouncing in, the Nesser brothers. Yes, we talked about these guys too. The Nesser brothers come soaring in and face the Cleveland Tigers instead. 
So another game would be canceled. Like, come on. Can't we just get a game scheduled? Can't we just go ahead out there and run around and run into each other? We're dealing with all this mess, but we'll just carry on. Because we apparently have a game scheduled against the Dayton Triangles in next week. Let's just pick up our bootstraps. Let's go play that game. But an article from the October 28th, 1920 edition of the Muncie Evening Press would do this. They would boast the upcoming spectacle as such. The Flyers Club with an all-star lineup would play the Dayton Triangle team at Dayton, Ohio, Sunday, November 7th. Both teams are members of the American Professional Football Association. Well, I guess it wasn't really that bold, but given the previous circumstances, I guess it was because they played this one game and all these things get canceled and stopped and whatever and so on and so forth. But manager Earl Ball signed some more players. How do you do that? I mean, you keep losing games. You don't keep losing. You keep losing the chance to play the games. I mean, didn't really mention this, but the 1920 season is like wild, wild west. Players are just play for multiple teams throughout the year. They just go any which way they wanted. Whoever would pay him that cheddar. So it was no different for the Muncie Flyers trying to get players to play in their team. But nonetheless, the day of November 7th, 1920 is here. So what happens? The game gets rained out. I'm like, what? Doing this research, I thought football plays no matter what. I mean, sure, nowadays we got lightning bolts and maybe Hurricane Corona comes around and tornadoes maybe. But you're telling me that we're going to cancel it for rain? Well. The game does not happen. Chalk it up to another cancellation and another footnote in the history of the Muncie Flyers. And as you can imagine, the players, they're getting sick of this. They're like, man, we think we're going to play a game, but we're not even playing, so we're not even getting paid because back then there weren't guaranteed contracts. Maybe some were, I don't know, but most of them weren't. You didn't want to play. In fact, we even heard about this in the past, a long time ago episode, where they were kind of like, hmm. I don't think we're going to make enough money here. So they would cancel the game for certain reasons. And maybe that's what happened here. It wasn't the rain that canceled it. It was like, hmm, we're going to lose money. Let's, uh, sure, throw the flag. Canceled because of rain. Really, it was we didn't have enough money to pay the players because we weren't going to get enough fans to show up for gate receipts to even be able to make our expenses. But nonetheless, the teams, a lot of them, they're like, the players are gone. But finally, Eight weeks after losing in that first game, 45 to nothing, they were challenged by the Gas City Tigers to play on Thanksgiving Day, November 25th. They accepted this challenge to play the Tigers that up to that point were 9-0 with a point differential of 443-9. to But they're like, you know what? I don't care if you got this 9-0 perfect record, your 443-9 to point differential. They're like, bring it on, man. And this also comes from Roy Sy's article. And it goes as such. The Thanksgiving edition of the Gas City Journal had this to say about the upcoming Thanksgiving game. Congerville has been playing in the Football Association with Akron, Canton, Dayton, Chicago, and other big teams and have been successful. Congerville will have a bunch of noted stars in their lineup and hope to humble the unbeaten Tigers. He then went on to say in the article, well, I'm not sure what their definition of success is considering... Well, think about it. They only played one game in this APFA. They lost it 45 to nothing. They can't even schedule a game because nobody thinks that they're even worthwhile, the dirt that they walk on. All the teams, the players, that is, they're leaving the team. So how do you determine that they're successful? But this is marketing, baby. Anyways, they end up beating the Tigers. The Flyers beat the Tigers, even though they were undefeated in that huge point differential in the season. They beat them 19 to 7. Then they played and beat the Muncie Offers More AC. I don't even know what that means. They beat them 24 to nothing. And then on 12-5, December 5th, apparently the fans and the players of Muncie Tigers, they're like, we don't get it. We want to beat you. We want to revenge you. We got to avenge your death. So they play again. The Flyers would win that game 13 to 7. Again, all this is from Roy Sy's article on Professional Football Researchers website. And Roy wanted to point out that the Flyers are only given credit for one game in that 1920 NFL season, especially if you look at the NFL.com's website, but the other three should have counted because even though it was a non-APFA team, the same thing was said for many other APFA teams. There was no, like I said, wild, wild west. You're scheduling whoever you play. 
play your grandma's friends in the backyard will give you a W. I'm not sure why, but this is how it went. This is what it was said. This is just what was stated in the article. And I'm not going to speculate on anything because it doesn't much matter. The NFL official standing site has the Flyers listed at 0 and 1. Of course, let's even make it. It's <laughs> make matters worse. It was 45 to nothing in 1920 the inaugural season. And again, they would rise in 1921 only to go 0 and 2. And then just finally bleed out. All right, I'm done. We're going to disband. We're going to carry on. And they might not have had a successful stamp on the NFL. But in the end, I mean think about this. Ultimately, Earl Ball and the Muncie Flyers were invited to the adult table when he represented the team in Ralph Hayes Auto Showroom on September 17th, 1920. The team and the city can forever say they were part of the original 14 teams of the NFL, and technically, albeit only one game in the official records, played on the first regular season day in NFL history. However, they got crushed just like the Romans at the hands of Hannibal's mercenaries back in the day. And just like enemy planes being monitored back in early wars on those old school screens, these Muncie Flyers were just blips on the NFL radar. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude Podcast and were able to gain some gridiron knowledge nuggets about the blip on the NFL radar that was the Muncie Flyers. This team may have only had three official games according to the NFL's website, but the city will forever be able to state claim to being a founding member of the NFL. And I'll tell you what, if you like this show, please go ahead and share it with a football geek like yourself. You can head over to, send them to thefootballhistorydude.com, where they can learn about way more than just this topic about how the NFL has rose to power. Next week, we get to talk about another original NFL team. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs>